I hope I don't get in too much trouble today. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I, you know, every now and then, well, quite constantly, the Lord tends to surprise me. And um, I got surprised this morning when we stood in that circle over there. I got surprised. Um, you know, when you hear from the Lord, it's actually not very hard. Thank you for that underwhelming response already. It really isn't hard to hear from God. I know people um, are constantly coming to an altar because they don't have any wisdom, they lack direction, they need to know what God wants to get done in their life. But I would just beg you to consider that the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. And I would beg you to consider that if you're not hearing him, it's because there's way too much noise in your life. God is always talking. He is always, he is not playing mind games with the church at all. So with that, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm just going to jump into what I want to uh, teach um, for a few minutes. And, and then I'm going to give you a word. Um, that, that word is what surprised me this morning. And I, at first I thought, well, Lord, this is what's on my heart, but I can't even imagine why this church would need to hear this word until I heard the word for this church. And that's why you're going to need total trust. Total trust. <clears throat> okay. First and foremost... If, 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 if I could get you to trust God, the benefits of trusting him are absolutely phenomenal. One of the um, things that um, the Lord said to me years and years ago, um, speaking on Wednesday night, Pastor, um, I was frustrated with our own church that the very people that needed the word of God the most showed up the least Thank you for your wonderful response one more time. And um, they would call on Thursday after Wednesday and need appointments because they had stress and struggles. And, I mean, real, real, real problems. I mean, real problems in their lives. But what they actually wanted was private sermons because if they had come on Wednesday night... They would have heard every single thing they needed. They would never have made the phone call if they had just showed up. I'm telling you, God is always talking. He's not, he's not playing mind games. And so in my own frustration, I said to the Lord, why don't they show up? I mean, the word is it's the kind of word that you assimilate for Monday morning Christianity. That's what Wednesday night is, at least at our church. And, um, and the Lord said, because they don't believe that there's any benefit in it. That's why they, they don't show up early and leave late. The reason people don't show up is because they don't believe that the Word of God has any benefit in it. And I'm telling you, the Word talks about in keeping them, which is the instruction of God, the Word of God, there is great reward because He is a rewarder. If you're going to come to him, not only do you believe that he is, but you have to believe that he is a rewarder. If you only believe that God is and you've come to him, but you do not believe he's a rewarder, you have not come all the way to him. He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's all good news, by the way. I know you feel a little rebuke, but I'm not rebuking you. I, I don't live here. Okay, I don't live here on Wednesday night. I got no dog in the hunt. I'm just telling you, I am ravenously hungry for God. I am more excited now. I, I'm telling you, we're about to enter into the things are going to happen on this earth that only God has faith for. God's going to blow our minds is what I'm telling you. And in the history of God, and he's got some history. Okay, God's got some history. Red Sea's part. The fire of God comes. Are y'all hearing me? But in the history of God, he's about to outdo what he's ever done before in this planet. We're going to see a world harvest. We're going to see it. So, so, trust. Trust is not an obligation. It's a privilege. When we trust God, the invitation from God to trust him 
is an invitation to a better quality of life than we ever dreamed we could ever have. And the fruit of trust is peace. Thank you again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this on you. Just so sh- the emotion of faith is peace. And if you've got real peace, you've got real faith. If you do not have peace in your life, that is because you do not trust God. But the second you trust him, immediately you will have peace. The second you can put your eyes back on him, the second you say, you know what, I'm not God, he is, the moment that happens, you're going to be flooded with peace. I'm telling you within seconds of, of saying out loud to yourself or to your situation, your condition, okay, when you say, no, I'm going to believe the word of the Lord over everything I feel, over everything I see, over everything I'm experiencing right now, God is not a man that he can lie. Father, I trust you. When you do that, peace will come back to you every single time. So there's a benefit. The benefit of trusting is that you get to walk around in a peace and the world, if the world, if we could bottle peace, we would be billionaires. The world is searching for peace. Have y'all noticed lately that there's not any anywhere? Well, let me tell you another horror story behind that. You look into the church today, and you show me five pastors that have peace, and I'll tell you that it's miraculous. I don't know five pastors that trust God. Thank you for your underwhelming response. So if the, if the pastors are not trusting God, where is the church at? And the problem with all of that is when the world looks into the church and sees your life, what in your life would make them thirst for God? What in your life would make them want to give their life to Jesus? Are y'all hearing me? And see, everything in me right now is about the way the church looks to the world because I'm all about evangelism like I've never been in this before. And it's time for us to wear God well. God is not upset. The word actually says that God laughs at his enemy. God is not nervous. Before he ever started us, he's already finished us. He knows the end from the beginning. Read the end of the book, we win. So if you want to live in real peace, you're going to have to trust God. And you can choose to. You can choose to right now come out of the turmoil that you've been in all week long. Right now, you can choose it. You can choose on Monday morning not to let that turmoil come back on your life. It's a good word. Let me give you some scripture to back it up. I wrote these words down. The only only antidote to the turmoil of this world is trust. Jeremiah 17, 7. Most blessed is the man who believes in, trusts in, and relies on the Lord, whose hope and confidence the Lord is. Whose hope and confidence the Lord is. I like that word confidence. I I told James, when this started coming to me, I was actually in an airport in Michigan and called my husband and said, I think I'm going to find, I think I'm going to, because I think I was supposed to be preaching the next week at our own church um, I'm, I, I hear the Lord saying something about trust. What trust is, is actually believing. You do know that, right? And as soon as I said it, he said, I knew you were going to need this. I knew it this morning when I was studying, and I found something for you. Do you know who A.W. Tozer is? Anybody? This is A.W. Tozer. Now, he is, um, he's passed away, of course, but he's very tithery, fithery. In his language, and he, he's going to use vocabulary that's not really um, in my vocabulary, so I'm going to dissect it a little bit, if that's okay, and this is all for my sake. I'm sure everybody in here is going to understand A.W. Tozer. It's just that I, I struggle in comprehension sometimes, so I just, if you don't mind, I'm just going to dissect it a little bit. A.W. Tozer says, believing then, now believing is trusting, believing then is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind 
to behold the Lamb of God and never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. At first, this may be difficult, but it becomes easier as we look steadily at his wondrous person, quietly and without strain. Distractions may hinder, but once the heart is committed to him, after each brief, I love this phrase, excursion away from him, the attention will return and rest upon him like a wandering bird coming back to its window. Now just stay with me. I would emphasize this one committal, this one great volitional act which establishes the heart's intention to gaze forever upon Jesus. God takes this intention for our choice and makes what, is, what allowances he must for the thousand distractions which beset us in this evil world. He knows that we have set our, the direction of our hearts toward Jesus and we can know it too and comfort ourselves with the knowledge that a habit of soul is being formed or is forming which will become after a while a sort of spiritual reflex requiring no more conscious effort on our part. Let me rewind that CD, okay? Let me jump back. I would emphasize this one committal, this one great volitional act which establishes the heart's intention to gaze forever upon Jesus. I just, I'm, volitional is not a word that I use. It just isn't, I'm, I just would not use that. My children do, but I wouldn't, okay? And the word volitional comes from the root word volition. And it means the act of willing, choosing, or resolving, the exercise of willing, a choice or decision made by the will, the power of willing. It is free, unforced, and voluntary. So let me go back, A.W. Tozer. This act of our will to intentionally, constantly behold the Lamb of God. When we behold the Lamb of God constantly, our whole system, spirit, soul, body, socially and financially, will sit back in a sweet spot in God and we will have a peace that passes the understanding. And you can if you will or you won't if you don't. And, and I'm, I'm letting you know that you can decide today I'm going to behold the Lamb of God. Y'all, the only way you can behold the Lamb, the only way is not in your mind's eye. Um, the, I see the Lamb, you know, mm, mm, you know, the Lamb. No, you have to look at the Word of God. To behold the wonders of His person is what A.W. Tozer said. So you have to ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you see Jesus like you've never seen him before. And he will turn the, the diamond, the jewel of who he is, and you're going to catch light or likeness of Jesus that you've never seen before, if you will. It's voluntary. Or you can live in turmoil. And God will let you live in turmoil until Jesus comes. Now, I'm not saying you're going to go to hell, but you can live in hell as a Christian on this earth or not. It's up to you. It is up to you. And that, that frees me because I'm choosing not to. Now, the phrase that I also love is when your mind takes a brief excursion. Okay? I love that word excursion. What happens is you get up with your heart intent, you spent time with God, you, you want to behold the Lamb, you want to trust Him so you can walk in peace. And then real life hits. It's not a conference. There's no one there to make you feel like worshiping God. You with me? It's real life. And your, your brain will fight you sometimes and take this excursion on all of the things that could happen if God does not come through. Are you, are you with me? And when that happens, though, because you've said to God, you're going to say to God today, I want you to touch me. I want you, I, I'm inviting you to interrupt my life with conviction. I need you 
to grab me and say, hey, 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 put your eyes back on me. And I'm inviting that, Lord. I'm inviting that. And you'll find that through the day, even though your brain goes on excursions, he will help you. He, there's a scripture in the, I think it's the Living Bible. My, the lady that discipled me when I got born again was my biology teacher. She had blue hair, wore moonlight gardenia perfume. Are y'all with me? And wore pearls like Ozzy and Harriet pearls and had that little dress. And she was, she was never from where I was from. She was never in sin like I was in sin. But, but her job was to disciple me. And I would come to her with, I don't want to do the will of God. And I'm just going to be that honest. I'm just going to be that honest, Mrs. Potter. I'm going to be that honest. I don't want to do the will of God. I want what I want. And she said, Tracy, you're going to have to give God your want to. Okay, number one. And then she read out of, I think it was the Living Bible, it was probably good news for modern man. That's how old I am, and anybody that's old like me knows that was one of the first Living Bible-type translations. And she said, that she read the scripture to me, that God will help us want to do what he wants us to do. So what you've got to do is say, as an act of my will, Lord, I'm going to trust you. This is harder on survivors. If you've had to be your own strength and you've had to be your own source, are y'all with me? I'm talking about prior to knowing Jesus. It's harder on survivors, and I'll tell you why. Now, look look at me. Survivors don't trust anyone. They've learned not to trust anyone. And here's why. You can't trust anyone that you do not know. Thank you for your underwhelming response because I just laid a heavy one on you. Because if you're sitting in turmoil day in and day out, it is because you don't know him. Now here's the good news behind that. You can know God. You can know God as well as Reinhard Bonnke. All it takes is time. You can know God as well as Jesus. I know you thought, boy, that's sacrilegious. No, Jesus prayed a prayer. Father, I pray that they would be one in me like I'm one in you, and they would be one with you the way I am one with you. He would never have prayed that prayer if that kind of oneness was not possible. You can know God as well as anyone that has ever lived on this planet. All it takes is time, but you cannot trust anybody that you do not know. So your capacity to trust is determined on you knowing God, which is fixable. You don't come to church on Sunday morning because you don't want to know God. Thank you for your underwhelming. Wow, that's a good word. Volitional. The act of using your will voluntarily, unforced, and free. I'm volunteering to trust God today. I'm volunteering. George Mueller, he was a he was a, a great man of God in England, that during the worst times of the world, we're talking world wars, famine, impossibility, he has 150 children that he has to feed three meals a day. He's got no means, no money, no radio station, no Christian television, no mailers. Are y'all hearing me? He's got no microphone. He's got no help, no way. It cannot be done, but he's on an assignment from God, he's qualified to say this. George Mueller says, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. Now, I know that sounds like a rebuke. It's not a rebuke. That's your thermostat. You can actually check by your anxiety level If you're trusting God, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of faith is the end of anxiety. That's why I'm telling you, once you put your eyes back on the author and the finisher of your faith, 
you will instantly come to peace. Instantly you will. It's an amazing power. Now, this is, and I'm a why person, and I've already told you why, but I'm going to tell you again, okay? Why? Why? Anytime you trust anyone or anything that proves trustworthy, it puts an end to fear. Let me give you an example. Because I do not know Pastor Dan as well as I know Pastor Mac Ballard. Okay, but if I called, I know Pastor Mac. I have known him since we were in a storefront building in Sumter, South Carolina. And I'm not even going to tell you how many years ago that is. But James and I have been in Sumter for 40 years now. A long time ago, Pastor Mac walked up these rickety old stairs in this storefront building. We had no sign. The paint was peeling off the walls, and the carpet was shag, nasty, gold, and orange. Okay, we had borrowed chairs and our equipment was taped together when we went, met Pastor Mac Ballard. But through the years, through the years, getting to know them as friends, I can guarantee you this. If I was almost anywhere in the U.S. and I was broken down somewhere, and I called, because I couldn't get a hold of my husband, I called Pastor Mac Ballard, and I said, y'all mind if I call him by his first name? Okay, because there, it's not a, it, there's, okay, it's not dishonoring. But I said, Mac, this is Tracy. Hey, girl, how you doing? You know how he is. Mac, I'm in trouble. I need some help. He would not even say, well, what is it do you need? He wouldn't even say, let me see if I can do it. Tell me what it is. He would say, I've got your back. I'm coming to you. Where are you? He wouldn't account what it would cost him. Are y'all with me? He would not consider that he, didn't, he couldn't do it. He would move forward toward me. And if Max said he was coming, I could rest my head. I could rock my seat back in my car. On the middle, in the middle of an interstate, at, in, at 12 at night, if Max said he was coming, I could rest my mind. I would not be in any anxiety. Are y'all hearing me? And knowing that Mac knows everyone on the planet anyway, he would probably call one of his friends and get me off of the road so I wouldn't be on the road. But I'm telling you, you can rest your mind on people that you trust. When they say, I'm there for you, I'm coming, don't worry about it. it are y'all hearing me? And, and the, so I'm telling you, your mind will rest when you trust. It, it ends fear because of the one that you're trusting is trustworthy. It ends fear. I'm, what I'm trying to do is help you find the gauge of where you are. And listen, God knows if you don't trust him, he already knows it. And if you, if you want, but here's the, everybody wants to. Nobody's trying to disappoint God in here. Okay, and he's going to help you today. I want you to know that I do not want this to feel like a rebuke to you, but more of an encouragement to you. Okay, um, the word confidence, the Webster's 1828 dictionary defines trust as confidence. A reliance or resting of the mind on the integrity, veracity, justice, friendship or other sound principle of another person. I'm telling you that is just good. It's listen, a reliance or resting of the mind on the integrity, veracity, justice, friendship or other sound principle of another person. And the world's going to look at you and say, I don't know what you're on. Because everyone on this planet needs to get or take the edge off. Lost people do what lost people do because they're looking for something to take the edge off. 
We've just discovered that his love is better than the cheap substitute the world can offer. His love is better than the wine or the intoxication of money, sex, power, drugs, and rock and roll, or whatever it is that they're putting their confidence in. Does, are y'all with me? But it's not illegal for you to need the edge taken off. Thank you for your wonderful response. The word clearly states that Jesus is the prince of peace. You pull it up in the raw language and it'll literally say, will tranquilize your soul. Set your mind in a place of ease and peace. He's calling to you. He's called, listen to me. I can hear him right now. This is not in my notes. Is there any weary among you? Is, is there anyone that's weary and heavy laden? I will give you rest for your soul. That's your mind, your will, your emotions. Whatever phrase the nerves of your life come unto me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I will take the edge off. Proverbs 29, 25. Are you bored? I, gotta, I, I don't know what time it is here because I'm, I'm somewhere in the future and I look much better than I do right now. How, how, how much, what, what time is it? Okay. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever leans on, trusts in, and puts his confidence in the Lord is safe and set on high. There's another indicator. You can, you can gauge your sense of trust by the sense of safety. Is, you know, and if your brain is always saying, I don't have enough retirement, that's because you don't feel safe. Are y'all hearing me? Thank you again for your, okay. The, but the action word, the word that unlocks, the golden key that unlocks the power of, of being set and safe is the word put. Put. I was amazed at this word. Put is not passive. I don't know how to tell you this, but peace does not come to the passive. All peace comes from confrontation. Thank you again for your wonderful response. See, what we want is a speaker to come in, lay their hands on us, download the peace of God, and not require us to get up in the morning and enforce the defeat of our fears and our anxieties and our worries. You won't, you won't have this if you think that it's coming that way. You're going to have to get up and get aggressive. You're going to have to put your trust in the Lord. That word put... Putting our trust in God and casting our cares on him requires that we make a decision to do it, number one. But the phrase put, okay, is all through the Bible. Let me just give you some examples. Put on love. Put on the new man. Put on the shoes of peace. As well as put your trust in God. Proverbs 3, 5, listen to it. Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not, do not, do not, do not rely on your own insight or understanding. Your own insight will jerk you out of the peace of God so fast it's not even funny. You don't even need a devil. I mean, who needs the devil when we have you? Are you with me? You do not need a devil to come out of peace. All you need is for you to rely on your own understanding and your own insight. And what that means, you're going to go by the way you feel. And feelings will drag you out of the will of God so fast because one day you feel like you, you got to have a husband, got to have, I've got to have a husband kind of thing. You marry somebody and three days later, he's got his dentures in a glass on the side of the bedside table and his toupee hanging on the bedpost. And you don't want a husband anymore. Are you with me? 
Feelings will drag you out of the will of God. Feelings cannot be trusted. There's only one that can be trusted, and it's the Lord. So do not lean on your own understanding. Psalm 55, verse 22. Now listen to this. You're going to... The word cast, cast your burdens on the Lord, releasing, I think I'm in the Amplified, releasing the weight of it, and He will sustain you. He will never allow the consistently righteous to be moved, slip, fall, or fail. But the power word that makes that happen is the word cast, and it is the word put. Same word. You pull it in the Webster's. It's not the Webster's. You pull it in the Hebrew right there, and that word put pulls into, Hebrew is very pictorial. It means shock put. And that's an old Greek game that they play today in the Olympics. And this big burly guy gets this huge cannonball, that's what I would call it, this round metal weighted cannonball, and he spins around and he casts, he shock puts. And it is the picture of taking extraordinary effort to get it off of you and as far away from you which means God won't do it but you can do it and he will help you get it off are y'all with me because there you know people love pity but I should say it. It, it, it I'm gonna get in so much trouble in particularly women love pity and if you get this off of you how are you gonna get your attention Thank you again. See, and, and I hear the Lord saying, ask them, Tracy, aren't you tired of it yet? Aren't you tired of it? Some of you are looking for love in all the wrong places because you refuse to trust God, and the Lord is saying, aren't you tired of it yet? Come unto me, all of you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can rest your mind that I am trustworthy. You can trust me with every intimate area of your life. I can hear the Lord asking, aren't you tired of it? And people that want to defend themselves for whatever they're involved in, Well, you can't hide from God. But how's that working out for you? In real life. In all things that pertain to eternity. You're you're wasting your life on things that will not satisfy. Aren't you tired of it yet? Webster says that trust is a resting of the mind. Paul confirms it in Hebrews 4.3 when he says that those who trust God enter his rest. The promise, listen to me, I just almost want to weep for some people in this room today. The promise yet remains. The promise yet remains. You know what it takes? It's not my notes. Just surrender. The more surrendered you are to him, the more peace you're going to have. The more surrendered you are, the more anointed you're going to be. Thank you again for wonderful response. I'm telling you, there's so much power I'm I'm just going to say this because some people are afraid to surrender to him because they want what they want more than they want what he wants. But listen, getting your own way is very, very overrated. 
And how many times people that have walked with God for a little while would tell you they're so glad that what they did not get what they prayed for. I am so glad that God knows what I do not know. And when I don't get what I want, it is always because God has my best intention at heart. He, he knows what I don't know. He knows what will really satisfy me. See, it says that I has not seen and ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for those that love him. So, see, when you don't get what you want, it is, it is because God wants to blow your mind. But when you don't get what you want, you don't surrender either, and then you're blaming God for your miserable life. And he is not obligated to give you grace to stay in sin. He is not obligated to give you grace for things he did not tell you to do. But there is a grace to help for those that are in need. He gives grace to the humble. What does that mean? Your knees are bent and you are surrendered to him. There is a peace in that. It's a good word. I'm just going to keep preaching it, keep preaching it. <clears throat> now, now, real life. We don't want to be pressured. Now, I'm qualified to say this because I was um, on my permanent report in the school are written the words, educably retarded. The best they saw me ever do is live in a group home and work at a factory where you folded cardboard boxes. That's the best. And the mantra of a victim, I, the reason for that is I could not read, I could not count, I still cannot count, but I can read. And I guess if I needed to count, I would. I could, but I don't. Are y'all okay with me? Uh, just being this honest. So, the, because my mother um, drank alcohol and did drugs when she carried me. So, I have al the al classic alcohol syndrome. So, the mantra of the victim is, I'm a victim. Don't expect anything from me. And this government will pay you to stay a victim. And I, my thing is, was, and still is to this day, and I work with myself on it, is don't pressure me, man. Don't pressure me. So I would take all the dumb classes. Can I say that? Because I didn't want the pressure of having to measure up. I didn't want the pressure, you with me, of trying to do better than I could do. And it is, must be a human fault, a fallen mind. Because the word does not tell us that we will not live under pressure. It says in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have pressure in this world, but be of good cheer. I've deprived it of its power to harm you is the literal language. Throw a party. You should, you should have more joy and more peace under pressure. Well, I don't like this sermon right now. Okay, because it's going to fly in my face on Monday morning. I have to live it. But here's the deal. I found out in the past couple of months that pressure is good. And pressure and stress are not the same thing. And God will let you go through pressure to bring the best out of you. And it'll only become stress if you do not respond to it properly with the word of God. When you're under stress, it is because you took your eyes off of the lamb, off of the word of God. You with me? You took your eyes off of the lamb and you fell into stress. You're responding incorrectly to pressure. 
You take the Word of God and you say what the Word says. You make yourself surrender to the Word of God. Ignore the way you feel with your inadequacies or whatever it would be for you. And you say, God, by you I can do all things. Thank you for your underwhelming response. And I'm going to give myself to this. The reason the Holy Spirit came was because, and Jesus said it several times, the number one description of the Holy Spirit is a helper. He does not come because you do not need help. He comes because he knew you would need help. He came to help. He came to teach. He came to guide. And your surrender in your areas of pressure will cause you to become better than you ever dreamed you could be. You think that any of my guidance counselors saw me as a public speaker? They didn't even see me read. I learned to read. I moved out of a first grade reader when I was 16 years old. I, I'd go to church services and no one would ever prophesy over me. They would only prophesy over the pretty people. You with me? I'm not telling you that you'll live a life with no pressure. I'm telling you that you can live stress-free when you put your eyes on him. All right. I hope that helps somebody. Uh, okay. So let's come to... Sunday morning where everybody lives. The best way that, y'all, you know, I, I was not raised in church, I think you can tell. So I'm not used to, I don't understand the church brain, which is you show up and act a certain way in church and then you can live however you want to live outside of church. But the best way to walk with God is with honesty. Because you are laid naked, the word says, and bare before his eyes. We don't live our lives like we're living in front of God 24 hours, seven days a week. We live our lives with a church mind that you come into the presence of God and after church you leave the presence of God God, listen, even when I was lost, he was with me. You, you might not believe that, but I'm telling you, he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. No, not ever. It is so emphatic. So the truth is, if he knows it anyway, I might as well not pretend to be something I'm not and and you're not deceiving God, you're just deceiving yourself, so you become religious in it. So if I'm tr struggling trusting God because I've got something bigger than me, I can't, I got a mountain I can't move, telling. Well, that's not real faith. You know, the faith people, they're, they're, they're number one thing. Now, this is my belief. You go into a, a real faith church, and it, it should say above the door, you're not allowed to hurt here. Well, y'all, if you can't hurt here, where can you hurt? I mean, if you can't come to the church and say, I am struggling, doesn't it say to confess your faults one to another and pray for each other? Doesn't it say that? So I decided, and of course, this was back in the very beginning of you know, just loving God and living with him, that if he already knew, I might as well be honest. So, if I'm struggling with unbelief or lack of trust, I'm just going to tell him. Jesus walks up to a father one day. The, the, the father had enough faith to bring his tormented child to the disciples. The disciples were having extraordinarily successful meetings. So he brought the child to the disciples. And of course, they hit a brick wall. It doesn't matter why. We won't talk about that right now, but I want you to see how Jesus treats people. 
he comes up and says, all things are possible to him that believes. Do you believe this? Can you believe this? And the father with tears, what are the tears about? He's just so tired. He's, he's, he's seen this kid thrown into fires, nearly drowned. This, this kid is in absolute, complete torment. He's seen it year after year after year. He wants to believe. Are you hearing me? He, he, he wants to believe. And he says to Jesus, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Help me here, God. And do you notice how nice God is? Do y'all notice Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and I can work with somebody that wants to trust me is what I am saying. Because he's nicer than church people. He's nicer than faith people. You'll get a miracle when you're honest. And when that cry is sincere, I, I'm trying to get here. Help me, Lord. Are y'all okay with me? Because I don't want you to leave here feeling like, man, I, just one, one more sermon on what I ought to be. You ever go to these churches where they walk in and preach the word and you feel worse after you leave? Because, are y'all okay with me? You've act, and it's actually the word, but you feel worse than you did before you came in? Because somewhere they left out the element that God's actually nice and he's trying to help you. Thank you for your wonderful response. So, okay. Uh, let me give you another story. Matthew 8, verse 2. Suddenly a leper walked up to Jesus and threw himself down before him in worship and said, Lord, you have the power to heal me if you really want to. My Lord. You have the power, but I don't know if you have the heart. God would rather you doubt that he had the power than that his heart was to heal you. But my translation, it might be the message, it, it might be, I don't know, maybe the Passion Translation. He says in that translation, of course I want to heal you. Of course I'm going to help you. If you had enough faith to come, you've got enough faith to get your miracle. It's mustard seed. You, got, you, you can feel your fingers touch together. It's so small. It's not mustard seed. It's a mustard seed. If you had enough faith to come, you have enough faith for the miracle. Of course I want to heal you. Of course it's my heart. Of course it is. Of course, of course it's my will to get you through this. Of course. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, okay. What I do, this is, what, this is me, um, I have come through um, ovarian cancer, stage four. In that situation, I went from stage four to zero in a 10-day period of time. No surgery, no radiation, no chemotherapy, okay? The one thing that happened to me at the very beginning of that diagnosis that, that started the 10-day countdown to stage zero was I was engulfed, I was captured by the spirit of the fear of death. People will rehearse your funeral to you. They'll tell you how their granny got fried and chemoed and, um, you know, and they died anyway, bless his holy name kind of thing. And the Lord interrupted that seizure of complete fear when he said to me, Tracy, the, only, the worst thing, the worst thing, the worst thing that could happen to your life as a result of this disease is that you will see the face of God. In other words, it is retarded for a child of God to fear death. 
did not give me permission to die. It gave me permission not to be afraid. Are y'all with me? Then he said, your only job is to maintain your personal peace. It's your only job. Because peace is the emotion of faith. Okay? And I've had other killer diseases, rare, rarely diagnosed diseases. Now, for those of you that are in a struggle with your bodies, trying to get healed is very hard. Are you okay with me? It's, it's very hard to try to get healed. Work with me for a second. Because there's this idea that it, it's, it's up to you. So you're trying to get healed and you're trying to stay at peace. Are y'all with me? And nobody lives through this. It's terminal has been announced three different times to me three different diseases. I understand at the second time, I was ready for it. When they said terminal, I said, "Uh uh-uh, done that, been there, and I have come through the other side. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I've already already won. Okay, so put a fight. Are y'all hearing me? But here's, here's the best way to get your healing, to get your miracle, to get, let me just say this, your money, because that, that can kill you because of the stress of not having enough, throws more people into divorce than anything else. Are y'all okay? This is, this, is how, this is me. This is what I do. I studied the goodness of God. I ate, slept, and drank that God was good. I can quote every scripture on God's goodness because... If, if you struggle, especially if you're in pain for healing, okay, you're struggling there, it's easier to believe that God is good than it is to get healed. Because if you believe that he's good, you'll automatically know that you're healed. Are y'all hearing me? He is the healer. Healing is what he does, but goodness is who he is. Of course, I want to heal you. Why? Because it's who God is. He's just so good. He's kind. He understands us. Jesus is touched with the feelings of my infirmities. He's not a God far off. Of course, I want to heal you. Of course, why? Because I'm good. So I, listen, this is what you do if you're struggling to trust him Do a fresh study on who he is because you can't trust someone you don't know. Do a fresh study on who he is. These are just a couple of things that I wrote down, okay? He's just, which means he'll make wrong things right. But in order for him to do that, I have to keep my hands off of making it right myself. Thank you for your underwhelming response. If he says vengeance is mine, it means vengeance ain't yours. And this is where you die. This is where you surrender. You bless those that curse you. You pray for those who despitefully use you. You love your enemies. You heap coals on their head, which means when their fire goes out, you be the first one to try to answer their prayers. Thank you for your underwhelming response. That's what surrender does. It kills you. (laughs) Just thought you'd like to know that. But you'll be happy and you'll live at peace. God is good. God is merciful. God is holy. Now that sounds scary to some people. But holy means set apart. It's a courting term. He's literally saying, I've set myself aside to be your one and only Be ye holy as I am holy. So you set yourself aside and have no other gods before you. Very, very intimate, precious God. 
is my one and only. God is holy. Also, God is kind. Nicest person you'll ever meet. He's the most lied about person on this planet. God is gracious. God is faithful and true. If those that ride horses in here, you know what chaps are? The word says in Revelation. Now, if you win a pair of chaps, it'll, like pro rodeo, it'll, it'll have the championship, the year, what, what it was. It'll run down the leg of those chaps, and it's kind of like a trophy to you. On his chaps, because he rides a horse, is written the words, faithful and true. He's the champion. God will never divorce you. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Faithful and true. God is love. He is the same at all times, and we can depend on him at all times to keep his word. Now, I'm almost finished. When you struggle, because Monday morning is coming. You feel real good right now, man. The word will penetrate your lack of trust and penetrate your fear. And you just, you get fixed in church. But Monday, when you struggle, the way you get out of it is you go back. Remember what God has already done, how he's already come through. The fact that you even got saved is the most powerful, miraculous miracle on the planet. If you don't have very much history in God's goodness and his mercy and his faithfulness and those things that he is, you can borrow somebody else's. See, if, you're, if you've been hit with some, let's just say, killer disease and someone has said you're terminal and you, you've never even believed God for a headache, you've never seen God do anything at any time, you can borrow my testimony. It's the power, the the. the the testimony of Jesus is the power or the strength of prophecy. In other words, because I said earlier today, I went from stage four to stage zero in a 10-day period of time. It sent a prophetic declaration across this whole room that anyone that is in any trouble at all in their body, you can grab that as a word from God that you're going to overcome this. Okay? You can borrow it. You can borrow it. You go back. David did this when he, he's, he's been anointed and he's the kid at 12 years old in a field looking at stars as big as your fist saying to God, what is man that thou art mindful of him? That's, that's who he is. He's called in from a field. He's anointed by a prophet for a ministry he never asked for. Meanwhile, his brothers are professional soldiers. They're, they're pro-level soldiers. They come up against this Goliath, this wall of impossibility, this thing that mocks who God is. And he's just simply taking food to his brothers, and he hears the ranting of this agitator, the ranting of this intimidator, the ranting of this thing that defies the armies of God, and it gets all over him that that ought not be. He says something to his brothers. His brothers kind of want to kick him to the curb. Somewhere in there, he makes enough noise that he is brought before the king, Saul. Saul tries to put his armor on him. I know you know the story. David can't do it, and he says, son, you're not going to, you're delusional, is what basically Saul says. And David says, what he does, instead, and to deal with the giant in front of him, he goes backward. And he says, my God has given me the power 
to kill the lion and the bear. A lion grabbed a lamb. I chased the sucker down. I delivered the lamb. When the lion rose up against me, I smote it and the same with the bear. You go back to how many times God has already done more than you could ever dream, more than you could ever think, more than you could ever comprehend. Ephesians 3.20-ish says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think according to the power that's working in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is the strength on my insides than the pressure on my outside. There's enough testimony in this room to bring Auburn to its knees. There's enough testimony in this room to bring the world to Christ. God has already done more than we ever dreamed he could. And things that we didn't think we would survive, somehow our joy has been restored. Come on, y'all. Weeping might have been for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And with every child of God, even when we lose, we win. We are not like those. I'm quoting scripture to you. We are not like those who have no hope. Yes, we buried some people. Yes, we haven't seen everything we wanted to see. But there's a hope in us that's beyond. It's beyond. Because this ain't it. This, y'all listen to me. We're not in a dress rehearsal. This is the real deal. But after this, I'm stepping into another realm. And I'm still not finished. The word confidence, if you pull it up into dictionaries, it'll, it'll say a positive expectation. Now, I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to, I probably have said this before. The person with the most hope has the most influence. You want me to say it again? The person with the most hope has the most influence. James and I, my husband, have flown above the Arctic Circle in Russia, landed in a city called Archangel. And in that place, the people that said they were Christians thought that they had the power to say who could get saved or not, who could get spirit-filled or not. And so because we're paying for this, we rented the building. There's 4,000 plus people, standing room only. They are so crushed in this building that they threw the chairs out. And now they're all just standing, gnarled, hands arthritic. They are, they're not that old, but they look like they're 100 years old. They are weathered. They're, they're malnourished. This is a hopeless, helpless situation. There are no roads. It's a closed city. You can't leave it. There's only a railway and a runway. So they're under this oppression that is so dark. And I am told by the powers that be that I'm not allowed to mention the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We all, my testimony, now I know that this is unusual in America, but my testimony is I was a Satan-worshipping, drug-addicted, alcoholic witch. I hated God. I would never give my life to Jesus. I hated God. That's my testimony. And when I received Christ as my Savior, I was instantly filled with the Holy Ghost and fire, and I was hurled backward across a room and fell into an open vision. I had an experience with God. I can't separate my personal salvation from the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I can't. I know it's two experiences, but I can't within seconds of each. Okay, so, so they said to me, um, we don't want you to talk about this. And I said... Not in rebellion, but honest to, to the Lord, why? Why would you tell people that they can't be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it was because they believed that you had to measure up. No, he comes to measure you up. He, he, you don't, he doesn't come because you're already strong. He comes because you're weak. 
So they said, promise us you're not going to mention the Holy Spirit. I lied through my ever-loving teeth. I, I did. I'm just gonna, I said, yeah, hand me the microphone because the person with the microphone is the one with the power. And I preached Jesus, and I preached the sudden infilling of the Holy Spirit, and I saw with my own eyes, because I was the one person with hope, and I had more influence over their sickness, their sin, their lack of salvation. I had influence over what happened in that room. I saw with my own eyes 4,000 people swept out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Within seconds of that, with, with no, no person touching them, hands lifted, they were filled, they were endued with power. And I was suddenly grabbed, taken to a van with my husband, and dropped off at the airport. But it's too late, baby, it's just too late. Does anybody understand the great theologian James Brown? Wow, I feel good because a church was born. Can a nation be born in a day? I'm here to tell you it can be. Can a city be born again in a day? The answer from all eternity is yes, absolutely yes. And you're about to see it. You're about to see it. I have a confident expectation. And everything's easier when you have confidence. You walk into a job interview, you're the person with confidence, you're going to get the job. Everything is easier in real life. See, and you know not to put your confidence in people. And if you feel your confidence sinking, listen to me, it's because you just took your eyes off of the lamb. So up, I felt my peace leave. Lord, I'm looking to you. You're my all in all. And if I don't get what I want, I know it's because you've got my best interest at heart. Are you okay with me? Okay. One more thing. Confidence is to us what fuel is to an airplane. An airplane has the capability to fly, yet remains on the ground without fuel. It's impossible to be consistently confident if our confidence is misplaced in people or things because they are changeable, but God never changes. And he does not lie. He is the rock we hang on in a universe gone wrong. Those are my words, universe gone wrong. I heard this over here. That, I don't know if you saw me. I said, I got to write. I got to write something down. I'm going to risk this. Now, what that means is, after I leave, he won't do this in front of you because he's going to be polite to me. But after I leave, if he doesn't agree with this, he's going to say, she had too much pizza last night or whatever. Is that all right? Yep. When you move... When you move, you will see salvation restored as in the early days of this ministry. When you move, you will experience the engulfing power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as in the early days or early years of this ministry. When you move, you will be aware of me moving in new directions, coming from a new approach, instituting new procedures. I, you need to hear this. Can I repeat that if you don't mind? Because if you are stuck in the mud with how it's always been, you're about to get whiplash. When you move, it's not going to be the same look, the same church. I'm adding. I, okay, I just added that. I'm not reading. I'm adding. When you move, you'll be aware of me moving in new directions, coming from a new approach, instituting new procedures. You will adopt a new look, a new image, new songs for the new people I'm bringing to you. As I relocate you, I will shake off the old and I will cause my breath to refresh, renew, restart, and reset you and to recenter you. These are the days to soar as eagles on the thermal winds of my spirit. Don't be afraid. Don't draw back. Don't refuse. 
When you move, you will return to the footprint of the spirit that was established in days gone by. How long have you been here? I don't know how long you've been here. I, I have not talked to him. I don't know how long you've been here. But there was a footprint of salvation, healings, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. There was a footprint in the original ministry, this, this beginning place, okay? When you move, you will return to the footprint of the spirit that was established in days gone by. I will see, and that's what I wrote down, this is what I was seeing. I see a house that has been closed up for years. I see the hand of the Lord opening the door again. I see the windows open and the ever gentle, ever powerful winds of the spirit blowing out the stale, blowing out the stagnant, blowing out the old, and blowing in the new, blowing in the fresh, and blowing in the miraculous. You will know that the ancient of days makes everything new again when you move how much trouble am i in good i'm not in any trouble okay it did okay good oh i did <laughs> i had to preach on trust to get that word why don't you stand to your feet just a few minutes because i can still hear him saying aren't you tired of it aren't you tired of it Aren't you tired of doing life all by yourself? Aren't you tired of the anxiety and the fear? Father, every life in this room, as we just stand in your presence, every, every heart, every situation, every condition, and every circumstance that exalts itself against the knowledge of God in our heart, every bit of it, every impossibility, all the stress in Jesus' name, I break the power of it off of this precious family in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord God, that you have pushed the reset button, that you are recentering every life in this room. I break the power of impossibilities. I break the power of diagnosis that's been laid on some of the lives in this room. And I declare in the name of Jesus that God is above all. God is above all. And in Jesus' name, we break it. We thank you, Father. We thank you for a new day. We thank you, Lord, for the windows to be open. The doors are open. The, the hinges have been taken off of the doors. And the wind of God is blowing a new hope, a new hope into this family in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We thank you now, Lord. We thank you now, Lord. Now, I know that some would say, well, Tracy, get, let us come. You can come to the altar, but let me just say this before you do if you want to. Coming to the altar is not necessary today because come to the altar or not for you to walk in peace you're gonna have to choose to trust and no one loves an altar like I do I'm not trying to you know get out of a service early okay I'm just telling you that you're gonna have to choose it he's the author he's the finisher and he's everything in between I think that it is Hebrews that says, looking away from all that will distract unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And Lord, you are worthy of my trust. And God, even though I want what I want, I surrender my want to to you today. Because I do believe, Lord, that you know what, what, what I don't know, that you have my best interest at heart. I know that's a hard prayer to pray, but it is the place of peace. It's the place of peace. So put your hand on your heart right now. I'm going to help you. You, don't, you can just put your, you put your hand on your heart. I'll pray. You don't even have to pray after me, okay? But you just need to hear this. Lord Jesus, I give you everything that I am. I give you everything that I am not because you already know it. You know me, you know what I am, and you know what I'm not. And regardless of my past, regardless of the impossibilities, I'm just telling you today, Lord, I absolutely, completely, 100% trust you with my life. I am tired, 
I'm tired of it. Whatever that means, I can hear that phrase in this in the sanctuary today. I'm tired of it. But even though I am tired and I am tired of it, I'm going to put, I'm going to cast my care on you. And I thank you, Father, that your word says that you will perfect that which concerns me. So I give you my concerns. I give you my children. I give you my bank account. I give you my body. I give you my destiny, whatever that means. I give you, Lord, every ounce of my life. And everybody said, amen and amen and amen and amen. Come on, and amen and amen. Is that all right, Pastor? Is it okay if I'm finished? Okay. It's your church.